So I was curious, um, I saw a number of hands up, but who knew about that term a year ago? Are there any hands up? What is research, uh, research ops? No one, did you know about it a year ago? Wow, okay, well this kind of proves the point, so I should just go home now. <laughs> So I'm here to talk about uh, research operations today and uh, an initiative called What is Research Ops? Where is my clicker? Let me find that. So initially there's this question mark. What is research ops? I could swear, add your expletive there, not another ops. Oh my God. We've got uh, DevOps and we've got Design Ops. And now we've got Research Ops. And I've heard mumblings of Content Ops and Customer Ops and even Craft Ops. So why another ops, you know? Like, why do we need another ops? And specifically, research operations. So here's a wall of text, and I'm not gonna ask you to read it right now. Um, it's a definition that we've, out of this sort of eight months of research we've done, it's a definition that we've come up with. What I do wanna point out here is that uh, it's, at its very core, it's really just another operations, whether it is research ops or DevOps. So let's look at the, the main words in here. So we've got mechanisms and we've got strategies, and we've got roles and tools and processes and support and delivering and scaling the craft. If anyone knows anything about DevOps and design ops and all these other ops out there, that's pretty much core to all of them. It's just that this one is very specific to researchers and that's where it shifts a little bit and becomes, um, I guess, different to everything else. So before we unpack this, and during the next uh, half an hour or so, I'm gonna be unpacking what that definition is and telling you the story of how we got there. So it's a story of, of global collaboration, um, a story of exploration as well, and I kind of get an image of um, the old explorers getting on a ship and going out into the middle of nowhere. It's about shaping a new practice and shaping it together, not just as one person doing a keynote, which is kind of an irony that I'm up here, um, but also you know, someone writing a book about it, but really an entire community across the world and across the industry coming together to define this thing that really wasn't well-defined or didn't exist before very much. And importantly, it's also about making friends across the world. It's been just a really heartfelt and immense experience to get to know all these people in the industry from everywhere, from India. I've got uh, Nishita here as a friend and um, you know, people that I've met only in person in the last two days, which has really been quite something. So in today's talk, I'm gonna talk about the Research Ops community and about the What is Research Ops initiative that we did. And I'm also I'm gonna start with giving you some context. Then I'll introduce you to the team. Then I'll share with you what we did together, what we learned, and very lastly, that one always gets stuck, what's next? So we've done all this stuff, and what are we gonna do next? So let's start with the context. As Danny mentioned, in March of this year, I sent out this tweet. And what I'd done was I'd set up a Research Ops Slack channel, and I called it the Research Ops Community. And at that point, I really thought that it would be me and maybe about 10 other geeks sitting in the Slack, and we'd have this like productive conversation, and that'd be it. So I bought a, a kind of a virtual pack of beers and I put it in the corner and I realized pretty soon that I really did, I, I needed a liquor store if I was going to be feeding everybody alcohol and having a good time at a party in the slack because there were within a very short amount of time, 200 plus people within two weeks. And the conversation was strong. It wasn't people coming and just kind of hanging out and kind of moping about and, and, and checking out what it was about. They were really actually sharing. It was a magical phase of the community where it was this, and if 200 people, then 300 people, then 400 people, like a massive big therapy session, right? These are the pains and the challenges I've been experiencing as a researcher or as a head of research. And no one's really made a space for us to moan and groan and talk about it. So I think that's some of the reason that it grew so fast as well. Wow, it's like a, it's the psychotherapist's couch. So one of the things with it that surprised me was uh, it had been, I'd been working in research ops and doing operations type stuff for more than half a decade. And it was very rare for me to find someone who didn't glaze over eventually when I was getting all excited about user research labs and data management for research content and uh, all the other kinds of geeky things that I would get all excited about. 
uh, recruitment and panels and all these kinds of things. Because that's my kind of thing. I get really excited about it. So to see all these people there just suddenly made me realize, oh my God, like this is not just me. There's something here. Eight months later, and uh, it's, it's been an epic eight months. Um, I've got a joke that I'm, I'm just wearing out one researcher at a time around the world. Anyone who's been, uh, has volunteered will like, we've got to slow down. A thousand plus Slack members, and every month I add around about another 150 people or 200 people from the waiting list. Hashtag research ops on Twitter is very lively, and I have to apologize to the medical and the academic fields for stealing their channel, um, because of course they've been doing this kind of stuff for years. And uh, research ops was actually something that existed for them, just not for us. And hashtag what is research ops, the initiative I'll be sharing with you today um, is now something that we can call done. I mean, nothing's ever really done, but it's somewhere near done. It's done enough that we've actually got something we didn't have before. We've had 60 organizers from around the world involved, and I know a number of them are in the audience today. Not all 60, but uh, unfortunately. Um, and of that, we had 17 countries and 34 cities in the end took part. So this is a great uh, thing to see. This is uh, Google search trends, and it's the search trends for uh, research ops as a term or as a word. And we had a 100% increase from kind of zero lines. So it was really interesting to see uh, your hands not go up because this is represented in, in the Google search trends too. From about March, you can suddenly see a 100% rise. So my understanding, and I haven't had the time to do massive research on this, is that the 100 is not 100 searches, it's 100% compared to what, where we were before, which uh, was just such a cool thing. And it relates very much to the initial aim, why did I start this community? I had spent, as I said, a very many, many years, uh, six, seven years researching researchers. Uh, many of those researchers are in the room today as well. Um, and really getting to know them as friends, having coffees, meeting in hallways, having meetings, and hearing their stories about um, how they were just battling with their work. Not because they were bad researchers, but because there was just so much to do. And I felt like I'd been doing this work in trying to build processes and things to support them and that more people should have this. So I thought, well, let's put together this community and see if we can uh, shape what it is. I've had my ideas, but maybe they weren't fully correct, um, and validate it so that it was something that people could actually ask for across the world and start to get into their teams. And we've achieved that because uh, on a weekly basis, I, I get a, a message on Slack or a DM on Twitter or email or whatever to say, hey, you know, last year I had a conversation with my uh, CEO or head of or whoever's got the money and said, we actually need some kind of support here. My team is growing. We're 10, 20 people. We need some, someone to do logistics and admin for us. And um, these people would say, no, we just don't have the money for it. And now they're emailing and saying, I'm having these conversations again this year. And if you look at those Google search trends again, and I'm able to point to the work of the community and point to a framework and point to these things and say, it exists. This is becoming an industry thing. And they're actually getting the buy-in. And so more and more people are being hired into these roles. So why now? Why has research shops become such a conversation now? Well, one could argue that uh, you know, we've stoked the fire. <laughs> we opened a space, we said, hey guys, <laughs> we get you. Like, we understand that you're battling, and we want to help you out. It's like, no wonder kind of a whole herd of people arrived. But I think you can't stoke a conversation that's not relevant in the first place. So, researchers are being accepted as an integral part of the design and delivery process, and that's a a wonderful thing. People have worked for years and years for this, to make this happen. Many people I know have been um, advocating this for a long, long time. And as that's been happening, in-house teams have grown bigger and bigger. So who here is in a, a team of kind of, let's say, uh, 10 people? Let's have a look and see. Good, a lot of hands going up, yeah. Five or six years ago, when I um, was looking at the sizes of the teams in the industry, and it would be quite unusual to see teams of 10, and now it's pretty, you know, it's not, I wouldn't say it's normal, but it's more and more common to find teams of 20, 30, 40, 50, and even more than that. And what's really interesting is, as the teams are growing, there's a need for defining the leadership, right? So you now have 10 people together, and you need a leader. And where do those managers and those leaders come from? 
Very often they've grown up through research and become senior researchers and suddenly find themselves in the space where they're having to lead an entire team and what does that mean? So there's a really interesting question as well around how do we define research leadership and I'll get back to more of that later. And then lastly, there's, uh, you know, executives don't offer you money for teams <laughs> if uh, they don't want something out of it. So more and more executives and uh, PMs and management and all that kind of thing are wanting, you know, we've got these teams of researchers, they must go out and research. It's more and more vogue to be customer obsessed, to want to be close to your customers, to know exactly what they're saying and doing so that you can respond to them and make decisions. And I do hear of stories where these things, you know, the ethos of that is there, and yet uh, the executives are not actually listening at the end of the day. But that's a whole other story that I'm sure someone else can cover. So researchers are being held responsible for a, not, a lot more than they were before, I think. Um, it's, a, it's an arguable point, but, um, you know, I, I remember a story of uh, a few months ago, I was talking to a researcher, again, another one of those kind of hallway conversations, and he was saying, you know, I'm just so busy and it's a wonderful thing. All these teams want me. They want me to come do research for them. But we've got no infrastructure. So when I create a report, I don't know where to put that report because we've got no kind of official filing thing. We don't even have, you know, we don't actually know how we're writing our reports. And the PM came back later, six months down the line and said, do you remember that, that thing that we did? We made decisions off the back of that research and now I'm being called up on it. Can you show me our line of decision? I want to see that original research so that I can, I can prove to my seniors that this wasn't my fault, right? And this researcher is saying, uh, my God, I don't know where it is. Like, I've got, to, I've got to try and go find it. I haven't had time. I haven't had time to file. I haven't had time to do all that. And um, it's how it is right now. So as an industry, in short, we're in this, this phase of massive growth. And it's incredible to be a part of it and to be... Um, here, kind of watching it as well. But there are, uh, you could say, caveats. I like to call them opportunities to that. And that's as, as the team sizes are growing um, and as buy-in is growing, it, you find that the coordination needs to grow too. You now have a team of 10, 20 people who are needing to coordinate with one another. What are you doing? I don't know. What are you doing? I don't know. Let's figure it out. And they're also needing to coordinate across the entire industry, you know, across the entire organization so that You've got, uh, like I work for Atlassian, we've got researchers all over the world. And we need to keep kind of getting together and coordinating that and coordinating with the entire organization, you know. Um, we've got uh, growing to-do lists and we've got growing pressures. And at the same time, the infrastructure and support is not growing. In fact, if I'm honest, it often looks something more like this. And if I get really seriously honest with you, very often it's like that. There just is no support. When you see the list of things that researchers are doing, and in fact have realized that it's more should be doing, you'll wonder how it, gets, it all gets done, and, and in reality it doesn't. I meet a lot of researchers who feel like they're failing at their work because they can't do it all. And to be honest, when you see it, you have to be a superman to do it all. I don't even think a team of one person doing research ops can do it all. Never mind one researcher also trying to do the research. So in this context, it becomes very easy to understand why the Slack channel and why the community, which now exists well beyond the Slack, why it grew so quickly. Again, you know, you stand up and you say, hey, I get it. Like, I understand. And you're not crazy. And you're also not a bad researcher. You just need support and you need help. And come and hang out with us and let's figure this out. Makes sense, right? So let me introduce you to the community because none of this would have happened without massive team effort, um, a massive kind of getting together and actually making stuff happen, ma massive co a collaboration. Right behind this was, uh, it's a team called, we nicknamed Team Reops. We have some very interesting nicknames in our community. Our latest one, we've, we've formed a board and we've called it the Cheese Board. <laughs> and many of the people in this team are on the Cheese Board. And I call them cheeses. So um, this was a, a small group, it was 10 of us that gathered early on, and for some reason we just kind of came together. There was no particular reason why we came together, we just did. And uh, we realized there's this amazing conversation going on here. A lot of therapy, a lot of sharing, but that doesn't actually make progress. It doesn't actually make something happen. What we wanted to do was we wanted a shared understanding of what is this thing called research ops? 
And we did this through a series of global workshops because we were researchers. And we had two, 300, 400, 500 by that point researchers in our community. And what do researchers do but research? And so we researched ourselves. And we got this kind of scenario going where we had researchers researching researchers about research. It's brilliant. <laughs> Initially, it was kind of the, the 10 of us. And we were from five regions in the world, USA, uh, UK, Europe, as in Germany. Um, India and Australia, and we felt you know, that's global enough and it was manageable enough, and let's run these five workshops. It was a very good idea. So we got a plan together, and then we got onto the web, just to kind of let the world know what we were doing, and we put out a medium post that kind of outlines this is what we wanted to achieve and why we were doing it. And then Twitter kind of fired up and, and kept firing up, and here's a couple of very nice tweets, one from Blink, which was right at the height of our what is research shops, workshops happening? And uh, just so nice to see these photographs from around the world of researchers basically getting together and working this stuff out. This is from Sam, uh, who ran the workshop in Singapore. And another one from Jane, who ran the workshop in, in Glasgow. And I love this one, because this was quite recent, and she said, who knew your tweet would uh, lead to a global collaboration to define research shops? And it's kind of interesting, because we did actually know. We were kind of behind there, scheming and plotting. Um, I guess, two weeks in. So through the power of social media, things grew well beyond our five workshops. I was getting emails uh, at least once a week or a message or whatever, some kind of smoke signal to say, hey, this is great, I want to be a part of it. Like, let me in. And so as we started to develop a framework around how do we actually run these workshops around the world. And before long, we had 34 cities involved. Now, 34 sets of data, no longer five sets of data, but 34 sets of data. And we had places like Moscow and uh, cities in China and Tokyo, just really kind of incredible. The only place that I didn't manage to actually find, because a few of these I went out searching because it became a little addictive. I was like, <laughs> this is really trying to cover the world. And as you can see, I didn't get anyone in, in, in South America, not for lack of effort. So again, as I said, it was a massive team effort, and here's the full list of global um, organizers, uh, people that are still very much involved in, in the whole process. We have had countless trans time zones meetings, where literally it's been from like one time zone to the next, and people arriving at a, on a meeting at five o'clock in the morning for them in New York. And I might be in Australia, um, where, I, where I live now, at 10 o'clock at night. And it's just been incredible, that commitment, and putting hours of time into gathering their forces and organizing spaces and bringing people into a space to run these workshops. So everything that we've achieved has been driven by team, and it's important to note that everything we've produced out of this is open source. So everything I show you today, you can go and take it. It's under, a, I think it's called an attribution share alike, uh, alike Creative Commons license. Take it, build on it, please build on it. That's the whole point of it. Um, it'd be great if you share stuff back with it and just attribute the community and say, this, this has come, you know, its genesis is this. So let me share what we did. What we did was we originally put together a guide for the workshop organizers, and what it included was a template as well, which in research speak is a discussion guide, right? Because it was like this quasi community building research project. And in the discussion guide, we laid out how, do you, how you run this workshop. And we ran in a way where you, uh, we use liberating structures. I don't know if anyone knows it. It's, it's liberating structures, one, two, four, all. And in brief, it's a really wonderful way of taking a question and giving it to a crowd of people and saying, let's work through this and come with some kind of major kind of common themes. And so you'll, you'll pose a question. Uh, I don't know. Let's go. I'm not going to use one of our, our ones. Uh, what color is your shirt today? Um, and it's a really bad example. But you sit on your own for a minute, and you write in a post-it note all your ideas around that. And then after one minute, you get together into groups of two, and you do that, for, I think it's for two minutes. Um, and you collaborate and figure out what the common themes are. And then as you get the drift into four, and then you go into a wider group. And what was nice about this, it's like a live affinity sort, basically, happening across all these workshops. But also what's really important is that at the beginning of the day, when we started to kind of grow from five to 34, we realized that there was a conversation around who do we invite researchers wanting to sample. And we had this tug of war between, well, we're a community, and uh, we want to be really open, so anyone can come. 
And, well, do we actually want people who are experienced? And at the end of the day, we erred on the side of community, and anyone came from really inexperienced people, people who've just started research, to heads of and you know, people who've been in the industry for a long time. And in the workshop I ran in Manchester, it was really interesting because all the experienced researchers were getting very technical about all these things, and, and someone who was new to the industry popped up on one question and just said, well, because it's fun. Just because research is fun. And it was one of the post-it notes, uh, the, the kind of notes that I held in my head because I realized, you know, some of why, what inspired me to do with this work is because I want it to be fun. You know, I want, I have fun making operational things that gives me a drive. It's not everybody's like thing, but it's fun for me. And, and if I can have fun and other people, it helps other people have more fun, then that's a great thing. So we asked these four questions. What research operational challenges have you experienced? What are your successes, your op successes, if any? And where are opportunities to improve research ops in your organization? And what do you think research ops includes? Looking at those questions now, eight months later, I would have probably done them quite differently. Uh, I would have asked just, what are your challenges? <laughs> what are your successes in terms of research? What are the opportunities to improve research in your organization? And then lastly, the fourth question, which remains valid for me. But I guess it's, you know, like everything's a learning curve, and particularly when you're doing everything on voluntary time and trying to have full-time jobs and running at a million miles an hour, sometimes you just got to throw something out there and get it done. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's been really interesting to also just look at that and, and see the kind of data we got and how we might have done it differently. We also ran a survey that was answered by 300-plus people. Um, that was so that if you couldn't make it to a workshop, you still had a way of engaging. And it must be said that Emma Bolton, who's speaking later, she was the real driving force behind this and has put hours and hours and hours into codifying the data. And, and I remember her saying that uh, researchers are very enthusiastic when it's, it comes to open text fields. <laughs> so finally, we get to what we learned. First of all, what is it? What is research ops? We had this whole hashtag around it. So what is it? So as you've seen earlier, when I flashed it up fairly briefly, we've got a definition now. We're not saying this is what it is forever and ever, never change it. We're just saying here's the first egg throw eight months later. We didn't have anything. We now, have, we now register on Google search. <laughs> we've now got this framework, which I'll be showing you through, and we've got a definition, something to be able to play with. And, and I would be very, very happy if it was challenged and thrown around and reformed entirely over time. So here it is. Research ops is the mechanisms and strategies that set user research in motion. It provides the roles, the tools, and processes needed to support researchers in delivering and scaling the impact of their craft, or the impact of the craft across the organization. Here's a quote from Melissa Braxton and Sheetal Agwell in Seattle. They ran the Seattle workshop. And it was interesting going back to this one as I looked through the data afterwards, after we'd done some analysis. And I'm going to praise you it. I won't read the whole thing, but uh, it's, it's very accurate. Um, it's infrastructure. It's making teams more successful. It's recruitment. It's community building. It's tools, the licenses, the software, the hardware, the AV stuff. It's supporting activities from teams. It's documentation. It's insight repos. It's stakeholders. It's resources for onboarding. It's creating partnerships. And I think what's really wonderful about this quote, and something that I'm very, very, uh, I get on a soapbox about it, is that operations is not just the hard, cold stuff. It's not just efficiency. It's not just tools, and it's not just manuals and systems. It's people. It's really about people, and, and there's something and it is about those communications and those partnerships, and how does operations actually support that? Kind of stuff. So as I mentioned, we had now instead of five sets of data, we had 34 sets of data. And it was always a joke at the beginning of the community that we might end up with our own research operations problems. <laughs> and it turned out to be true. So a whole lot of data. And Zach Naylor from Aurelius popped up, and he owns this uh, um, analysis platform. And he said, hey, we were kind of trying to use Trello, and which I love Trello. but." dragging content from one place to the next and trying to analyze all the stuff. And he said, throw all your data in here and, and, and have a trial, you know, have it for free for a year. And now he's actually a cheese on the cheese board, so I'm sure we'll have it free forever. 
<laughs> and it gave us some place to kind of put all this stuff and try and understand just how much stuff do we have here and what does it all mean and who's done what as well? Who has analyzed their stuff and what insights do we have? So things have taken a lot more time. Initially, we thought we'd, we'd have some kind of result by June and now it's September, October, and we've only just kind of had a result. Um, but what we did was we eventually said, okay, hold on, let's not stress ourselves out here. Let's just look at that last question, number four. What do you think research ops is? And analyze that and, and step forward with what data we have. And I know there's a lot of work now still going on. We've got a load of data that we're still digging through and, and there's, there's projects happening at the moment um, for people to actually start to look at all, what else do we know? What have we learned? So this is where I'm going to test um, the internet. Duncan's going to come and help me out. So Bridget Metzler in um, Australia, she took all the data from that last question and she said, well, let's throw it into this thing called Kumu. And the reason I'm going to risk leaping out of my slides for you guys and heading into the, 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 wide, the World Wide Web is because it just looks super cool. And this is, again, accessible online, so, you know, the, the links will be shared with you and you're welcome to, to dive into it. So the Kumu is a, it's a data visualizer and it'll be kind of cool when it pops up. Don't worry, take your time. <laughs> um, and what it is is all the data that we got. And it was interesting looking in the Kumu because suddenly we had a way of, you know, it's a visualizer. We had a way of visualizing what is this information that we've got. And there's a whole lot of stuff around research operations stuff, but it's also leadership stuff. And this is one of those cool times in research where you realize, Oh gosh, we've like got like much more information than we thought. I didn't know we were going to learn about leadership too. And actually, we learned that leadership's something that people are concerned about. So let me see if I can give you a little bit of a tour around here. So I can click onto one of these, and I think that this is the... I'm looking for purple down here. That's the leadership one. And you can see how can, it, it opens up, and you can hop in here. And so you've got leadership, and this is pretty much raw data in here. And there's all these terms around leadership, like legitimizing research and staffing and being accountable for the research impact. And uh, there's something in here that I haven't quite understood and I need to check up on. Servant leadership of research. I don't quite understand that one. But there's innovation and capability and all these kinds of things in there. So as I said, you can um, hop in here and there's all sorts of things to explore. Um, it takes a tiny weeny bit of learning to kind of get around there, but it's a super cool thing to start to kind of like leap into and see what kind of data we've got. Very cool. So what I did was I, um, and this is really only, just to give you a context of time, maybe kind of, kind of three weeks ago or something, I realized, right, we've actually, I've got these talks coming up. I need to have a thing. Oh my God, I need a thing. So <laughs> I took the Kuma as, as direct inspiration as you can see, and we, we'd always said as a result of these workshops that we would have some kind of framework but here's a thing that you can print out, you can show it to people, you can stick it on a wall, and you can build on it. So I hopped into Mural, which is what we're in right now, and started to just take inspiration from the, the Kumu, move the leadership out, and just put in the operational stuff. So giving you a brief um, tour right now. So here we've got research shops right in the middle, and around here are the kinds of terms that came out commonly. Um, so, we've got things like automating tasks, repeatability, support, which is an obvious one, and enables the research flow. And what's interesting about this is a lot of the stuff that's come through um, in, in quite a few sections, also there's a section on guidelines and templates, is my job's going to have a lot less friction if you just show me the pathways, right? If I know where to put my stuff when I'm finished with it, I've recorded a whole lot of videos, and if I just know I've got to put it there, and that's going to keep it safe and help me tick the boxes. This is going to take out a massive amount of RAM out of my thinking. I'm going to have to do a lot less thinking. I can just think about the research and get on with it. So this is real need for having processes that are repeatable, looked after, things automated. I'm going to give you, it's like a whistle-stop tour I'm giving you here. I hope you'll, you'll guide, dive in another point. Recruitment's a really big thing, obviously. Um, there was one really funny note again in the research that someone said, fix incentives, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. And recruitment came up as a similar kind of thing. And I thought what was really interesting is there's one bubble in there that says, um, thanking respondents. 
such a simple thing here, and it came up and often enough for it to really stand out. And I thought, it's really interesting. It's very important to researchers. As an ops person, I might not even have thought of this. And this is where that, you know, I keep saying that human angle coming in. I've done my research. I've now handed it to ops to say, um, I've done the research. These people are great. That person was rubbish. Pay those people money. And it's not just about that transaction be completed. It's about them really wanting to know that you have sent the money and said thank you. I just thought there was something in, in, magical for me in that. Um, we've got uh, budget management, which is a really interesting thing. I'm so working on, on that kind of stuff at the moment. I'm leading on research ops at Atlassian and um, working on a lot of the stuff. So you know, all of this I'm using in my day-to-day -day job, and it's been an incredible thing to have this kind of framework to be able to show my, my PMs and, and leaders and, and the team so that they can understand what am I doing? What am I bringing to them? And budget management, management is something, understanding, we're spending all this money on research and what are we getting back from it? It's really great to be close to your customers, lovely, it's fun to do the research, but how much is it actually costing and what are we actually getting out of it at the end of the day and where can we be more efficient? We've got things around tools, we've got asset management and internal communications. There's knowledge management, a really big piece that's one of the other big areas that everyone's like, if we could just fix knowledge management, uh, the world would be swell. <laughs> it's, it's a tough nut to crack, and I'm, I'm hoping in coming months with the community, there's some really smart people in the community um, who know a lot of, uh, they've been in the weeds and in the sticks with knowledge management, and I'm hoping at some point we can do a, a mini virtual conference that specifically looks at that. And we've got guidelines and templates. Again, I said that was a lot about uh, give me the tracks, give me the guidance on what I should actually do. And it's important here to point out that from an operations perspective, the guidelines and templates aren't actually saying this is how you must do research, because that is craft. It's about saying we're going to look after some kind of repository or some kind of knowledge base or something that helps you actually find those guidelines and templates and know that they're up to date. I'll touch on that again later, because it's a real distinction between craft and research ops and how the ops and craft sit together. And lastly, before I leave here, um, there was a very big piece here about around capability and opportunity. And it's something that, that um, the team in the, in, in the community are working on. As a researcher, now, you know, five, six, seven years, we've got these growing teams, which means that the, what, your career path as a researcher is also changing, leadership is changing. Where do I go as a researcher? So I'm, I'm, in, I'm a junior, then I go midweight, and then I go senior, and then I become a manager, even if I don't want to be a manager. Or what are my opportunities here? So as, a, as an operations person, you can start to be putting in places, uh, putting things in place to bring distinguished speakers in, challenge people and help them to write proposals to go make to do talks like this one. Um, all sorts of things that you can organize so that researchers feel within the organization that they are developing their skills, that they're going somewhere with what they're doing, that they're growing in their craft. So I'm going to leap out of this again. Duncan's going to come back and... While he's doing that, something really important to point out, if you can hold that image in your mind, is that this is obviously a multi-skilled, multi-person job. One person is not going to manage recruitment and knowledge management, because recruitment on its own is a very, very specialist skill, right? And it's a pretty full-time job. If you've got a big organization, it's a full-time job. This is not something that one lonely research ops person can handle, plus everything else. This framework is, it needs a team. Someone who is um, a knowledge management person, that's an information architect, a librarian. These people train for years to do that. So to have someone trying to do a little bit of recruitment over here, a little bit of knowledge management over there, and also being a bit of an expert in information security and legal is just not possible. That doesn't mean I'm saying to you that don't even bother doing research ops if you can't afford a five-person team. I'm not saying that at all. We've all got to start somewhere. At Atlassian, it's me, and I've got one other person who I've now put onto uh, recruitment to look after that, and we will build out over time. But what it does mean is be really realistic about what you can do and what you can't do. So I'm going to hop over a few slides here, which were really my backup slides in case the internet failed on me. There we go. So here's what it's not, because this is really important. It helps researchers focus on the craft, but it's not the craft. And what I've actually done, um, I'm working at the moment at Atlassian to put together 
here are the things we're doing. We're doing training, we're doing recruitment, we're doing knowledge management. These are the kinds of things that we want to do as part of our research strategy, which is Lisa Raykald is, is leading on that. And I'm looking underneath and I'm going, what are the operational things that need to happen to innovate that, to make that happen? Recruitment's obviously very heavily on ops, but training, the training stuff might be dealt with by, you know, the researchers are putting together the material and doing the actual training, but there's stuff underneath there, like a graduates list. This is, I mean, this is a perfect example. This didn't happen for no reason. Someone has worked out how you get in the door and how you're going to leave. Um, making your tickets a print. That's exactly that sort of stuff is the operational stuff around it. It's also, as I've said a number of times, not just about insights and data, but also people. It's not the methodology or the strategy. It supports that stuff. And it's not the leadership either. I'm a, I'm a leader on research operations, but I work with other leaders who are looking after the research side of things. And I say this, but at the same time, this is emerging. Everything's emerging, and I'm having to figure it out. My team's having to figure it out. Lisa's having to figure it out. What does it mean to have me around trying to do the stuff? Which is fascinating. And it depends, it's dependent. Research ops is not an island. It's dependent on a very good leader. If I have a research leader who doesn't really know what they want to do next year, they're changing their mind every three months, there's not any clarity on where we're going as a team, it makes my job almost impossible. If you want to start building out labs for usability testing, say the theory is, well, and I'm not saying this is the case in my case, but we um, want to focus on usability testing and whatever in the coming years, it can take me six months to eight months to get together a really decent lab. Um, so having someone who's got a really strong vision of where they want to go is essential for my job to be A, enjoyable, and B, possible. So 34 data sets um, about research ops, a lot more, um, a lot about research leadership too, as I mentioned. And what's so heartwarming is, um, I, I, Emma's actually working with a team that are building out a skills framework now. Like as a researcher, We've got all this information around the kinds of skills and things. I actually would be honest and say I haven't looked at that data yet. I've been so busy in this other data. But it's wonderful to see almost kind of happening in this community, people diving into this data and start to explore whole different things. As a researcher, what skills do you need? How do you go through? What is your trajectory? Um, I think it's going to be fascinating to see that coming out in, in I guess, uh, I'm not going to put a timeline on it, but in coming months. So, Keep an eye out on what we're doing, and, and if you're interested in this stuff, you're sure to see some more things come out. So what's next? We've had this epic eight months. I mean, all this has happened in eight months. I think many of us are wanting to go on a holiday for a little bit of time, just to take two or three months out to say, right, let's settle down. And I know from my point of view, we've also started off as this ramshackle community, just let's like put in all the energy and get going and stuff. And we've, we've put very little time into actually structuring ourselves. And now that we're in this place, we're realizing we better kind of sit back and, and, and actually look at what does it mean to be a community and, and put some structures in place. So our first aim, as I, say, I said, was to shape and validate research ops. And uh, we've done that in spades. We've got new aims now. And I think this is really important. It's, it's kind of my new soapbox. I get emails on a, on a regular basis, again, from companies who are wanting to hire research ops people, and that's just fantastic. I mean, uh, a massive achievement. But they don't really know what they're hiring for. And it goes back to that thing of they're thinking they might get one research ops person in to solve the problems of 40 researchers or 10 researchers. That's just passing one cruelty onto another person, which is not what we're aiming to achieve here. So in coming months, and I actually realized the other day that um, I've got a job description because I've recently hired someone, is to publish out, a, kind of, this is what you're going to want to hire. This is the sort of job description you're looking for so that you can make sure that you're very realistic about what you're hiring for and what you're going to get. But that also links into helping hires know what their job is. I've spoken to many people who are working in, in research shops around the world. There are more and more of us now. And they've said, like most people, I was hired in as the only person, and now I'm having to renegotiate what I'm doing because I've realized I can't do it on my own. I need a team. So it's a great thing for people to know that you need to negotiate what your trajectory is. So when I was asked to come work at Atlassian, I was very clear that I would need a team and that I wouldn't move to Australia unless over time I could argue for one at least. Um, and that's what I've got. And the last thing is to include small business um, in the conversation. It's an emerging field. 
And there are a lot of businesses emerging with us as well. People like Zach Naylor from Aurelius, or Nom Nom Insights, or whoever. And it's to have the conversation with them. As, as an ops person, I spend a lot of my time engaging with business, whether to procure, the, procure them or demo with them or whatever, because I'm, my job is to bring tools and systems into place. So as a community, we want to find ways of including um, small businesses in that conversation. And what I love is that many of them, when you get to know them, um, you know, they're, they're oftentimes running these businesses as a side to their full-time job, which is pretty amazing. They've also got some kind of burning fire in them uh, to help researchers have a better time and, and be more efficient and be able to do more with their, their work. So in closing, as I said, a lot more analysis to do. Um, and, and it looks like that kind of analysis is going to happen. Um, so the community's got its own momentum now. Um, this is what we've produced so far in eight months. And I keep thinking of moneysupermarket.com when I see the slide. It's been epic. <laughs> We've got a thriving global community. Um, we do monthly town halls now that are organized from, by someone across our global community. So next month is Johnny from Japan, um, which always sounds so cool. Uh, so he's doing our next remote town hall. And we generally have around 80 people pitch up to those, which I think is quite amazing. Um, we've got our medium that I regularly publish stuff on. And, and uh, we're very loose on the editorial side of it. It's just an open conversation now. If, if you want to. If you've got something to say about research shops, I love articles about experiences. If you are working with research shops and you have some experience, write about it and let me know. i um, be very happy to publish it on, on our medium. We've obviously got the Google search terms thing, which you can tell I'm very proud of. <laughs> and um, we've got more and more people being hired for this role. So it's kind of like, wow, you know, holy shit, what have we managed to achieve in such a short, short space of time? So to end, just to say thank you very much for listening. Um, here's a few ways you can engage with the community. Uh, you can follow at Team Reops on Twitter. Um, you can join the Slack waitlist. As I said, I, I add people once every kind of five weeks or four weeks. Um, the, the links will be available. I think that this, this, the deck's been handed out afterwards. Uh, you can come to one of our town halls. Uh, something very important is this is not a Slack community. It's a community that exists beyond the borders of Slack. You can be anyone from anywhere and join a town hall. Uh, you can watch the town hall videos on Vimeo. We've got one there, another one coming soon. And then join the conversation on Twitter as well. Reach out, let us know how you're doing. Uh, we're all going to build this together. Thank you very much.